<clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, our next two guests are our next two guests. If, you, if you're out the hallway, come on in. You don't want to miss this. And if you're in here, get out to the hallway. It's time to swap locations. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Adam Burgess and Jimmy Curry. Thank you. ROV de 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 chief. How are we? I almost said how are you. Oh my god. I gotta sit in the snake. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jeffy Breach, everybody. Wow, wait, aren't you blessed? Adam Fergus. We're blessed. Here we are. Together again. Do we have any LA natives here? Los Angeles? Oh, oh, oh yeah. Wow. Well, I Bur thought you guys all left, because we came. <laughs> right? What about Burbank? Anybody live in Burbank? No. Nah. <laughs> no one lives in Burbank. <laughs> um, oh, it's so good to be here. It's a like aptly named giving back tour because we give something back to everyone. Um, and you know, I was thinking, uh, Jeff. Yeah. What kind of things do you like to do to give back? In? Like you know, in terms of yeah, not no, I necessarily monetary charity. That's. Okay, I was up until 5 a.m. because I was watching <laughs> Ireland be beaten by the All Blacks in the Rugby World Cup. I don't know, I'm sure there's not many rugby fans here. Um, and I'm no longer one either because we got hammered and I stayed up really late to do it and now I'm dying. But anyway, so that's why my words might not make a lot of sense today. So I understood every single one of those words. Oh, thank God. <laughs> um, no, so, but, you know, in terms of the yeah. like giving back. In uh, I did... Um, with the intention of giving back, especially to this community, because this community was the reason that I got to travel to New Zealand and Australia, and I got I, I got really reconnected really with nature on those trips. So I made a short film called Gift, and it, the gift had many meanings. It was the gift that nature gives us, and it was my gift to the Supernatural family and to anybody who wanted to watch it, it. I put it out there, not as any sort of monetary gain or anything, just as sharing uh, just beautiful images that I saw, uh, animals, nature, and the importance of reconnecting with nature. How about you? How about, how about you? You know, it's funny, like, you know, every year we make these kind of New Year's resolutions and we're like, okay, this year I'm going to do this, and this year I'm going to give up smoking, and this year I'm going to not drink as much, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, it was, I don't know who it was years ago that said to me, you know, I'm, I'm going to do something rather than give up something, you know? Um, and, uh, and it was just something simple, because I'm quite a hothead, very short temper, especially on the sports field, anything like got to do with like sports and stuff. And, I just told myself, just you know, to the people that you're not necessarily nice to initially, the people that kind of rub you, try and have a have a uh, a different frame of, of mind and come at it from a different angle. And uh, I found that really rewarding for like three days. <laughs> um, so every year I try and get to like four days and five yeah. days and six nice. days. No, but uh, no, I just I recently Up to did, January fifth. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the, fuck the, everybody. Little Christmas, January sixth is always the worst for me. When the decorations come down, so does my attitude. <laughs> um, but uh, the um, it, like, I do, we did. Did anyone get the charm bracelets? Does anyone get the charm bracelet? Yes. Like Michelle Henny is some. She's an amazing woman. So we like you know we do these charm bracelet things and you know uh, you and you choose a charity and um, I. Uh, um, Oh my God! I fell blind. Does anyone know the charity I gave? I gave, I gave this charity that <laughs> it was a long night. No, basically, uh, when I was Ireland lost everyone. <laughs> but the um, the where's Michelle? Michelle, are you here? <laughs> um, no, but it's uh, it's it, it, the charity. I'll tell you what the charity does. It, it, it gives 
um, kids in war-torn areas, um, like sports equipment, and and uh, and, edu and educates them um, in classes on you know you know like regular schooling, teach them like you know academics and stuff, but also like right. sports equipment so that they can play sports like normal kids, and Sounds they don't want to have the facilities and refugee camps and stuff like that. So um, that's kind of huh. Oh, that's it's a typewriter. Mine was a typewriter. Very Aww. different typewriter. Thanks Why? to David Hayden Jones because he always ripped me about the type type that he always says, you know. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a it, and it's all thanks to this beautiful fandom. Like you know, they really inspire you to be to give back and to and le led by of course Misha Collins, who is possibly the most amazing human being I've ever met. Like you know his his uh, his charities and the amount of whatever he personally puts in is just phenomenal and he loves it he like he lives for it and um it's it's an amazing thing and an inspirational thing for for us all and definitely this fandom has given me the you know uh, made me up my game in terms of you know giving back to people great well, we, is there a dog going to ask a question sweet i love dogs this little german shepherd shallow shallow <laughs> Yeah. Hey, buddy. What's up, Bubba? Hi. Have you a question? Uh, yes. Uh, so my question is for... Uh... There's only two of us here. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Um, so my question is, uh, if Mick didn't die, do you think that he would have stayed and helped the American hunters in America, or gone back to England and dealt with the British men and letters there? Uh, I think very much he would have stayed here. He would have stayed here. I think, like... You know, um, Mick's, Mick, Mick, Mick's death was uh, it was interesting, and obviously I didn't want to die, but it was quite poetic in the end because he had really been flipped by Sam and Dean, and and kind of, you know, he saw their way of doing things was more charitable, I suppose, and, and kind of saw people, and this is the great imagery of the show, like saw people for exactly who they are, and not demonize people, and. Uh, and I think the, the, the British Men of Letters way was just uh, so vicious and so kind of like uh, um, uh, didn't really take into account the, the fact that everyone has a soul and everyone has a kind of feelings and, and uh, I think that's what Mick was discovered when he met Sam and Dean and he was quickly flipped. So I think he would, he would, have, he would have been an interesting addition to the crew. Also, I would have been in the show more, which would have been much better. Um, but yeah, I think he would. Have, I definitely think he would have stayed here. So you never know. We'll see, we'll see if he comes back this year. Fingers crossed. Thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay. <laughs> if you say so. For you. It's it's morning somewhere. It's so. Okay. Um, so I've been asking this question since like 2014 at Calvin Comic Con, and my other friend has stepped in when I've been working conventions. Jeffrey answered this at BanCon, um, it's, and so did David. It's, if you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be? <laughs> did everyone hear that question? If you were a tree, if you were a tree. what kind of tree would you be? What did I say? Okay, good. While you're checking out, what kind of tree? I bet you chose a really cool tree. You said tree. weeping willow. I was going to say a willow. And Davey said a juniper bush. Because he likes gin. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. Like, I want to say an oak tree because they live for, like, a long time. Um, but, yeah, uh, like, I don't know. What's, what's the easiest tree to climb? I used to love climbing trees as a kid. Um, and uh, falling out of them, invariably. But, uh, yeah, like, I, I know it's kind of a boring, easy one, but I think maybe an oak tree, uh, because, um... They're strong. They're strong, you know, like me. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I think I used to climb along them, but we had one in our garden when I was a kid, so... They um, smell good, too, don't they? They, they smell good? I think they do. It. Don't oak trees smell good? Maybe when you burn them. Not an oak tree. <laughs> Cedar. Um, Cedar, nice wood. Cedar. What's, where does the teak come from? Is there a teak tree? No. Yes. There is. Yeah. In Costa Rica. There's such a knowledgeable bunch of people, aren't there? <laughs> Holy shit, puts me to shame. Okay, I'm going to say a teak tree. Because they're from Costa Rica. Thank you. I'm sorry I didn't put a lot of thought into it, but I didn't really have a lot of time. Chad said he already feels like a tree. Okay, cool. But, in, in, you know, do you, do you know in, in acting school, you know, I briefly went to acting school, and, um, Obviously, as you can tell, um, we brief. 
But uh, you know, they, they make you do, like you know, be a tree. You know, and, and everyone's out here like, doing all this thing. And I remember looking around going, "What's <laughs> going on? Yeah, be no. a tree?" I can't. Um, I can't do any. Yeah, I was just too uh, kind of like do it. focused on reality to be like, I, I don't like, I can't do this. Just stand here like this. And what do I do? And also, I can't sit. As you can see, I can't stand or sit still for more than five seconds. When I was uh, when I was a kid and I used to get nightmares. Um, I go up to my, my parents' room and you know, book them and eventually my dad, my mum would send me and my dad to the spare room and I'd lie there in bed and I'd like, I really want to move and he would have to get up for work the next morning and I'd be like, oh, turn around and my dad would go, jeez, just stop fidgeting. That only made me want to fidget more and then you'd like, you want to move one leg or move your arm and keep, I kept my dad away for, ye for years. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm fidgety. If there's a fidgety tree, I might be that as well. I don't know, there's one that moves quite a bit. Um, anyway, thanks for that. I got nothing. Yeah, I got nothing. Sorry. <laughs> With the uh, next question. Hi. Hi. I asked this earlier, but I uh, wanted to hear your guys' answer. Uh, if you could have one career choice, what would it be? Like, if your characters were to return this season, what would you want their reveal to be? Mm -hmm. Well, the reveal? When they first appear in the first episode that they're back, they just, you see them in there, that's their reveal, they're blind. Uh, I had always, maybe kind of hoped that he, Asmodeus would come back all scarred up from the flames and, and more pissed off than ever. <laughs> and finally, take the throne <laughs> as the king. <laughs> I just thought I would like. <laughs> yeah, that's all. King of Thrones, which is the king of hell? Which throne? Oh, the king of hell. Instead of going from a prince to the king. That's awesome. And maybe instead of white, you wear black or something. No, I'd stay white. Stay white. I'd stay. Yeah, yeah. Because that that suit's already taken. True enough. True enough. Um, I think I would like. Um, oh, I'd like for Catch to be sleeping, like peacefully, and a little smile on his face, like a, like an innocent-looking Catch. And then just the camera would just pan up and just see me like that. <laughs> <laughs> Staring at him until he wakes up. And then, I don't know what I'd do to him like, you know? I, like, someone asked this question at a, at a con uh, recently, and uh, what would I like? Would I like to kill Catch or would I like to, you know? I'd like to toy with him a little bit, but then I'd like him to be my friend, you know? Um, you know, I'd torture him for sure for a while, maybe for a couple of days. And then, you know, um, maybe, you know, become friends and you uh, start our own revolution together. But, uh, just simply because I like working with David, but, um, uh, yeah, I'd like that reveal of, like, yeah. When you, when you said, like, oh, he's best gonna, serve he's, cold, baby. Sorry? I was gonna say, when you said he's gonna be, like, asleep or something, I thought you were like, I'm just gonna be laying right next to him doing the, the, the crazy eyes, just staring. Oh, at yeah, him. that kind of thing. That kind of thing, just like, but like two inches away from his yes. face, you know, like yes. that. And then wait for him to wake morning. up. <laughs> and just like we, I, but I'd love Vic to come back as an evil mother. Are there kids here? Just say uh, it. We all sign stuff? <laughs> I said just say it. Our panels can get quite toasty. Yeah, that's fine. Um, um, they got to learn sometime. Yeah, have you met Kim? Uh, uh, yes, you see, that, that whenever Kim's here, it's going to be okay. Cause... Or Brianna. Kim's already been on. Oh, she has? Yeah. She broke she the fuck fucking eyes. Oh, yeah. okay, cool. She broke the awesome. fucking She's eyes. a great leader, that one. <laughs> Hi. Hi. How's it going? Like your ears. Thank you. I got a tail, too. I'm, oh, look at you. <laughs> All dolled up. Is this your Halloween costume? No, just like <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's Halloween. That wasn't yeah. an insult. What the hell? She is wearing a costume. Let your freak flag fly, baby. Carry on. So my question uh, is for you. Okay, awesome. Um, really, uh, my heart just really swelled when you decided to change who you were trained to be and help Sam and Eve instead. How did you feel when you read that? When when your script came to you that you were going to be who I who I always kind of thought Mick could be if he hadn't been picked up off the streets by the men of letters, you know? Sure. Because it was really, a, you did beautiful. I mean, it was oh, thank you. absolutely beautiful. Yeah, look, I was so, like, it's so lucky because, you know, I, I joke about it all the time. 
Um, and uh, there's a snake on my chair. Um, I, I, I do joke about it all the time, like, you know, uh, I'd love Nick to have stayed alive, but it was quite poetic what happened, like, you know, he, he did start out, you don't really know, as you alluded to, you don't really know what, what, you're, what, you're, what you're getting when you read your script, and as David always says, he, like, he flicks to the back page to see if he's dead, you know? Um, thankfully, when I died, my, my agent called me, the, when she sent me the script, she, she phoned me beforehand and said, listen, just so you know, you die in this one. And like, like I didn't know how many episodes I was getting. I don't know if you did. Like, I, like I, I, I was supposed to get maybe one or two or three, and I ended up doing six. And um, you, you really fall in love with the with the whole family. Like, you know, and, and you guys. I hadn't even met you guys at that point. But like, um, it's such an enjoyable show to work on. It's such a great work ethic. There's so much messing and and fun that happens. But it's it's always like. On the, on, the, on the back of really hard work, and, and it led to a very happy work environment. So, with all that in mind, when, when, when your character starts making a shift, and you become closer with the, the, the main, main guys in the show, it's, it, it kind of like, there's a bit of a crossover, because you're loving being there, and you're loving it, and, you're, and, and then you're loving the character being developed in a way that like, it, the, the fans might like, and the fandom might like, you know, buy, and, um, but like, it's interesting playing a bad guy. Um, but I, I've never played a bad guy turn good before. It was really, it was a, it was a real fun experience, and uh, um, I, uh, yeah, I wish I did a couple more. You know. I want to thank both of you. You two were amazing characters. That's so sweet. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So sweet. Hi. It's my Hi. Friend, I guess. Uh, love you guys both on Supernatural. Thanks. Um, my question's for Jeffrey, and it's not related to Supernatural. Sorry. Uh, you're going to do a stint on Young and the Restless, which I have watched basically my entire life. <laughs> I want to know if you can tell me anything about who you're going to maybe interact with or how long you might be on. Uh, only if I want the CBS okay. spies what, to kill me in my can, sleep. What can you say? I can say... I'm very intrigued. I can say that it was a lot of fun and that... Um, I'm guessing, by the way things went, that there's going to be more than expected. Yay! Um, I, I can say... Because you were so awesome. What's that? Because you were awesome. Because it went great. It was one of those things that felt really good and everything. Yeah, it, it just was a very... Uh, everything about it was smooth. And there was a lot of excitement that I wasn't expecting. I just, for me, it was my next gig and then next thing you know like Soap Opera Digest is doing a whole cover thing on it and then Soaps in Depth are doing all these things and all these uh, websites and blogs picked it up and ran with it so I think they were like oh wait a minute <laughs> that's, I've, that's... I've heard a few rumors and I, I just hope that like I'm, I'm gonna say this I'm gonna see what your reaction is okay. <laughs> I, I hope that you interact <laughs> with Adam and I hope you interact with Phyllis because I feel like that would be a great Thing to see. I'm on the show. Oh, really? Yes, really. <laughs> and I hope you burn the Newman family to the ground. <laughs> well, thank you. November first, it's coming. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Is, is Cameron Grimes on Wynor? Yeah. 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 She's good friends with him. You know Cameron, red hair. I uh, had met she her played, now. She plays Mariah. Oh. See, I can't, I can't, I can't yeah, go. Oh yeah, because oh, I work. Sorry, with, you know. See, I was trying to get, I was trying to get yeah. it for you. <laughs> How you doing, man? How's it going? Good, thank you. And yourself? Doing well. Awesome. So, both of you came into the supernatural relatively later than most of uh, the actors and whatnot, and I was curious if you guys were either warned or had expectations of the of the show environment and the fandom itself. Like, were you warned? I feel like I just talked, so but I'll, okay. I, I, I could uh, go, but... I, you know, yeah, I had. I, 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 a friend, Eric, I did a TV show called Being Erica in Toronto, and a friend of mine, Erin Harplup, was, I did her audition tape. You know, like, as actors, you help out, like, you don't go into the cast and director's office all the time, you, you send in tapes. And uh, she called me one day and said she was, like, up for this, for this role. I think she played Ruby, did she? Is that right? Did anyone know? Um, um, and uh, so she, she uh, I, I did her audition tape and became aware of the show then. 
And then my other buddy, Mark Ralston, who I did a, a, a TV show with, he'd been on it uh, uh, in season eight or something like that as well. So I had kind of like, I definitely heard of the show. I had no idea about this. I had absolutely no <laughs> idea. Like it was mind blowing. But Ruth Connell, when I was, I, I, such a sweetheart. When I first arrived in, 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 in Vancouver, um, there was a note on my door uh, from Ruthie and she said, uh, from one Celt to another, if you ever want a cup of tea uh, and a chat, just let me know. And I was like, that's so sweet. It was my first experience of, of the camaraderie amongst the cast. And, uh, um, and we had that cup of tea, and Ruth was the one who told me about uh, the conventions. But when we first were on set, I was walking around set, and um, um, I think Phil Sabrisha was directing that episode. The episode before I was, I, I was about to start, um, Ruth took a photo, uh, a selfie of the two of us, and she goes, Just, uh, do you have your Twitter notifications on? And I wasn't very good at using Twitter at the time, and uh, not that I'm great now, but uh, uh, she goes, just, just be aware, your social media will blow up. And as soon as she took the photo and tweeted it, it just was amazing, it was ridiculous. I was getting all this, like, oh, what's going on? And then, and then I started like, reading some of the comments and stuff, and uh, went down the rabbit hole that way. But yeah, I, I, I quickly became aware of the, of the, 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 the size of the audience of the show, which was really cool. Yeah, my, I, no, I had no idea. I had, for, again, it was, it was kind of like, what I was just saying, it was my, it was all about the character for me. I got the script and was like, well, wow, this is a really cool character. I wasn't very aware of the show at the time. And then I did a little research and was like, oh, it's a very cool show too. And after that, uh, the, I think it was the night of the audition, it was right around my birthday, I'd had a birthday party and a, a, a Toronto actor friend was there. And I said, I think I might have got this part that I went out for today. And he said, what, is it supernatural? I'm like, get that, get that. <laughs> really, he goes, oh man. And he had been on, uh, Star, uh, Stargate, Atlantis, and so he, he's like, the conventions, he goes, it goes, Star Trek, Supernatural, but now, I think it goes, Supernatural, Star Trek. Yeah, babies! Yeah, babies! Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's actually you guys, so it's like... Yeah. So, no, I had no idea what I was getting myself into, and I'm still, I'm still to this day, to right now, standing on the stage in Burbank, I'm blown away at what... It is. <laughs> Do you remember your first panel and your first, like, well, yeah, it was Vegas. I went to Vegas and it was a quick thing. Yeah, Vegas, baby! Vegas! Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> it was, and uh, Richard Spade was in the back. They, they were like, your, your Q&A stuff. I'm like, what, my Q&A? He goes, no, you're going up on stage in like five minutes. I'm like, what do I talk about? <laughs> He's like, ah, oh, come on, your story, you'll, tell it, you'll figure it out. Sure enough, they pushed out and everybody was so friendly and so welcoming and had great questions and it was, it felt natural. All of a sudden this ancient sort of thing kicked in of like, oh wait, yeah, I'm a showman. Hi everyone. Yeah. It worked. It's good fun. Like, it's, it's yeah. like, you know, I always equated to, especially the panels, I always equated to like, you know, when you, if you do, if you ever do theater as an actor, you get that immediate response from the audience every night and then when you, you know, move on to TV and film and stuff, you, like that, that's a void that never is filled really, like you know, you get interaction. However, I think with social media that's changing. It is, it, it, very it, much so, yeah, a bit, you know, because when I first started, I remember doing like guest stars and stuff like that, and it, you just kind of do it into a void, even a lot of independent movies, no one really sees, but stuff like, well, when I first started doing the soaps, and then with this, after every episode, it's like walking out into a green room full of a thousand people going, here's what I thought of your performance. Yeah, exactly. Whether you like it or not. <laughs> Thankfully in the theater, you don't, you don't really hear them. Like, yeah. yeah. You suck! Yeah. Um, but like, this does give you that kind of experience where you can kind of like, get out stage and people kind of who are here, they obviously are here for a reason, yeah. so uh, they're your friends. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, I mean, my first panel was with David in <laughs> Blackpool. Was anyone here in Blackpool? You were? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Blackpool! Woo! The, so, the, so when we drive into this hotel, right? We're driving into this, I'm like, I'm just like, I was like this, what, what's, what are we doing? What do we do here? Um, we're driving in the bus with all the, all the other cast members, and um, the, Nor the Northbrook, or the Norbrook uh, Castle Pote because the L had fallen off <laughs> the side of this old, like it's like something from 
I don't know, like the shining or something, it did like but it way more dilapidated. It was this eerie building. Um, and there's a big convention hall out the back, but it was like it wasn't fancy like this, it was like a shed. And there were pigeons flying around in the middle of our panels. So I was like, what the fuck is going on? This is crazy. <laughs> but yeah, it's a it's it, you just you just you just start running with it, man. It's it's so much fun. I I, I love doing it. I you love guys it. make it easy, that's for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, mate. Great question. Hi. Hi, how's it going? Good. 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 Uh, so my mom is Irish, and so I grew up with a lot of stories and superstitions and things, and I wondered if you guys have any like superstitions or rituals that have just stuck with you that you can't get rid of. I don't go much for superstition. No. Like, yeah. And I, I like I do get a little bit OCD about stuff. Like when I do an audition, I can't throw out the sides, the pieces of the uh, the scenes until yeah, I don't burn. until I don't get it. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, ah, oh, fuck you, pieces. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then I burn them. Yeah, like just stupid things like that. But I, I went to school with a guy that um, you know every time like we'd, we'd be going to our dormitory, I went to boarding school. We would, the dormitory would be that way. And there's a pillar here, and every time like this would be the way to go. He'd go like this. And then on the way back, you'd be like that. I'd go around these pillars, and I was like, what are you doing? He goes, I just have to do it. Like, crazy stuff. But, um, no, I don't, like, superstitions, like, if, if your, your mom is a lot of, where's, what part of Ireland is she from? She's from Belfast. Oh, is she? Cool. Um, I was telling people in my meeting grade, I got a tattoo, a new tattoo, and it's, uh, it's an old Irish florin, it's a two shilling coin, and on it there's a salmon. Um, and sorry for, you know, boring you again, but the salmon is a, is a story of the salmon of knowledge. It's a really cool story. The River Boyne in Ireland is very near where I grew up, and it's a famous Battle of the Boyne where the Brits finally took over uh, uh, the Irish. But way back when, in Irish folklore, there was a guy called Fionn McCool. And Fionn McCool was just like, he went on to be this warrior, this famous Irish warrior. Um, and when he was a kid, he was kind of adopted by this old Shanachie, as we call them in Ireland, which is like a storyteller or a village elder. And this village elder was like an ancient dude, and he was always fishing morning, noon, and night to catch the salmon of knowledge. This story goes, the salmon of knowledge was hundreds of years old and had all the knowledge that there was to have in the world. And if you caught it and ate it, you got all the knowledge. So the old guy, eventually one day, he catches this fish and he brings in this huge big salmon and Filmicool helps him putting it on the spit and the, the old guy goes, I, I went off to get like you know seasoning or whatever he was going off to get. He goes, Tur keep turning the fish, but don't eat it. This is mine, I want to get all this knowledge. So Phil is like, I'm splintering this, but he's getting a bit bored, and he obviously leaves it, you know, cooked too long on one side, and when he turns it over, there's a blister on the salmon, so he puts his thumb on it, it's immediately so hot, he puts it in his mouth, and he gets the salmon, he gets all the knowledge. And so the elder comes back, really pissed off, but Fionn then becomes this famous well, character. He like, gets all the knowledge, because... Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Bit of skin, that's all he took. He didn't even have to eat the fish. Okay. All right. So, um... That's what, like, Irish mythology, I'm sure your mum has told you some fascinating stuff. Like, I really hope they start making some more movies about it, because there's so many fabulous tales of, and fabulous folklore that I grew up learning and forgotten all already, but um, there's, uh, yeah, there's some great stories if you ever... But did they eat the rest of the fish? <laughs> yeah, your man devoured it, so hoping that he got, like, a, like he got nothing. The old man ate the whole fish and got nothing. Got not, not even the Greek alphabet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I was Thank you. Oh. Thank you, and then board one. <laughs> Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you guys doing today? Awesome. Wait, wait, wait. Just real quick, I want to just go back to the story for a second. Okay, cool. <laughs> what's the point of that story? <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah. What's the what's the what's the takeaway? What what the takeaway was that he became this kind of like legend of Irish folklore because he had all the knowledge and oh, the, the guy who did the yeah, Fiona McCool. <laughs> Because he, because he, yeah. Now he's a legend. Now he's a legend. It's, it, it's, wow. it's not true. <laughs> I mean, um, but most tales like that are, they have, there's like a, it's like, oh, then that's why you never, what, turn a fish? Fuck. Four, three and a half hours sleep, and I'm being grilled by three. Um, I don't understand the point of the that story. That is the point of the story. Don't turn fish. Don't, don't like, turn fish quicker. But oh, uh, turn fish. Uh, learn to cook your fish. Uh, yeah. Well, there we go. Fifteen minutes either side. There we go. Okay. That's the part of the story. 
and that's why there's no American folklore. <laughs> What's the purpose of this? Yeah. It's a meme, though. It doesn't make any sense. Do you do that when you're watching Game of Thrones? This oh, yeah. is bullshit. Yeah. Oh, Hold the door. Totally. Nah. Totally. I, I don't just, buy it. Watch the yeah. cool clothes and the weapons. Like, uh, okay. Oh, there's a dragon. What does it all mean? Exactly. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Thank God it's over. <laughs> Sorry, as, uh, right. as you were, thanks. Rescue me. Um, so, I'm very passionate about ending the stigma about mental health. And so I was wondering what are um, you guys passionate about? Oh, Right to Play. That's the name of the charity. Thanks. <laughs> and there we go. I'm passionate about art and beauty. And, you know, Beauty in a sense of the beautiful things that we experience in life, trying to translate them somehow to others. But no, I think that falls into art, because I think art is beautiful, and I think it's a way to express your human experience to others now and in the future. And that's what other artists have done for me, is like giving me a way to, to not feel alone in a world that can be really crazy sometimes and, and if you see the world differently which I, it seems as if all of us do oh yeah it's, it, it, there's there's sometimes it's really nice to know that as as differently as you can think there are other people that are out there just as as different and and they can they can translate it somehow with a visual or with some words or with a song that makes you feel not so alone. And do you have, uh, I know you're very passionate about music, but like, is that one of the art forms that, you, that you, your go-to is music? It's one of them, yeah. yeah. And it's such a way of communicating it, which I love. That's why I like, I play percussions, and it's nice to be able to just sit in with a band or with a bunch of musicians that you've never played and start talking. Everybody just starts talking and with their chosen instrument becomes their language and you can all communicate without words and it's a, it's a, I think it's beautiful. Obviously it's a beautiful oh, form of expression. 100%. It's like, there's nothing like that when you, at a house party or you're at a wedding or something and someone pulls out a guitar and you're just like, so envious, that, that sounds so good, why did I never play music this instrument growing up? Yeah, oh, it's a bit <laughs> Um, and uh, you know, it's but it's yeah. just it's just amazing, and it, like you know, you you it, it, when you f your first on stage performance, you brought your your uh, your drum on stage, and it was like Vegas, it was awesome. Yeah, thanks. And uh, it's it's just so admirable to watch as as someone that is, as I said, tone deaf. Um, you can you can like to really appreciate you know other people's talents, and and uh, it you it transcends you to to a certain degree. Like you know, it's awesome. How about you? What are you passionate about? Friendship, you know? Uh, I just, yeah, it's so important to me. Um, um, and, you know, I had a pal who passed away recently, and it just really, really, we, uh, we spent the last few days on the phone to all your friends, and reminiscing and, and talking about stories. And it's like, it's, it's emotional, but, but I, I remember, you know, it's, it's always in these times that you pick up the phone, you call people you haven't heard from an ages and they call you and you're, you know, you sympathize with each other, but like I found myself going, fuck, what? This, this has been the best, worst three or four days of my life, but I've gotten to speak to all people I haven't spoken to in so long and really kind of reminded me how the importance of friendship and, um, and it, it, it can never, telling someone that you're thinking of them or you love them or that, like, you know, just having a chat about the weather, whatever it is, it's so important and we've got, you know, there's a lot to be said about, you know, the modernization of the world and, you know, social media and everything, but we have the means to just be in someone's living room in an instant. It's just, it's phenomenal. I just, um, and, yeah, I just, this past was really reminded me of that, of the importance of friendship. I think it's really important. So I'm passionate about that right now. Thank you. Thank you. So my question is for Adam. Um, Adam, the Bad Idea Tour really inspired me to uh, take my running a little bit more seriously, and so I did my first marathon over the summer. Oh, cool. how did you do? Where did you do it? So I did it in um, in Mount Hood, Oregon, um, and the only thing I cared about was whether or not I beat Misha's time, which I did by three minutes. So you that's beat, all that matters. You beat mine and Misha's time. 
didn't want to say that. We were, we were neck and neck. I, in fact, I, I went a little bit before, but uh, that's amazing. You beat us by three minutes? Thank Fuck you, you very much. Thank no, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, my question was, I know that in, you know, in my training process, I don't know about yours, which is why I'm asking, um, it was a lot of time kind of spent running by yourself, a lot of time alone. And it's just a lot of miles and a lot of road with just you. And so I was wondering what you listened to or what you thought about and how you got yourself through training. Not by not training. Um, you know, I think it was a joke at the time, but I didn't really do that much training. Um, and uh, it was a miracle. In fact, we had a dinner that night, and I was sitting at the dinner with like ice packs around my knees, like with like napkins from the dinner table, and they brought me little bags of ice, and they wrapped them around my knees. I could do the whole marathon. Oh yeah, twenty six miles you ran. That was fucking awful. <laughs> awful. Why? Why would you? Because Misha so? told me to do it. Oh. Like, you know. Because they were the But like you know, and Rob Benedict did it, and, and, and Jason did it, and uh, it was like it was so funny because you know immediately we all started off together, and Rachel Minor did the first five miles, and we helped push Rachel, um, which is my excuse that I keep saying I was pushing her longer than you were. Um, I pushed her up that hill. Of course, Jared gets her on the downhill slope. Um, but um, and we all started off together, but then after about. Six or seven miles. We were the first. It was the first kind of like water table, and and, and, and uh, all the the volunteers were there. Jared's wife, Jen was there. My girlfriend was there. Michelle Henning, who was a legend again, she was such a super charitable woman. She was there helping out. She organised loads of it. And, uh, and I turned around to Haley, and my girlfriend was like, "Jesus Christ, are we almost done?" Uh, she was "No, you've done five miles." Uh, and uh, so. Kept going, and I, I, like by by my like I, I had a snowboarding injury years ago, and it's never really bothered me. But like by mile 10, 11, I just felt a little, little niggly thing here, and I was like, oh fuck. And then you know, mile 15, 16, I, you're delirious. <laughs> so, but Jensen and Jared, of course, horsed on ahead of us, um, and uh, Rob and Jason kind of lagged behind a little bit, <laughs> and um, um, myself and Misha, like you know, <laughs> we were just like. Looking at each other, don't stop, don't whatever you do, don't stop. If you, st if you stop, I'll stop, I want to stop. And they were like, by mile 20, we're going like, this literally this pace. Oh, fuck. Ow. Uh, and then there were supernatural fans at like random corners. And of course, when, when, when we get there, we're like, oh, yeah, this is so easy. <laughs> but, then, but then, like, you turn, I was like, this has to be it. Like, it's good. Did we, this, like, watch this 48 miles or something like that. And, and uh, uh, we turn the last corner, and there's a fucking hill. It's like, it's like you can see the, the, the organizers going, this is going to really piss them off. Yeah. <laughs> and, get to, and then we got to crawl basically to the top of the hill. And of course, I sneakily had kept some of the tank for the running into the, you know, the stadium finish. I was running ahead of Misha, was like, get the fuck back here. <laughs> but for Misha, like, and he was yeah. the inspiration to do it. Misha would run five miles every day without fail in every convention. He'd get up early in whatever city he was in, he'd go out and run. But now he can't because he completely screwed up his hip. His hip was in bad shape beforehand, but completely <laughs> screwed up his hip, so uh, Misha needs a new hip. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but to answer your question, I, I, I did a lot of podcasts. I listened to a lot of um, political podcasts and uh, uh, audio books. Like, I really only did audio books. Um, and and then, I, then I started really just, just no, with no, no earphones. Just, Taking it all in and watching, I love, like just watching the nature and whatever, whatever I was uh, running, um, and uh, I just found it so peaceful and so therapeutic. It's just, it's a really nice way to just get into your own head and just have a little think. And um, but, I, but I'm obviously competitive by nature, so every two seconds, I'm, oh, that was slower than the last minute, and try and pick it up and stuff like that. And, but it's it's great. I'll never do another one. Yeah, it sounds horrible. It's horrible. <laughs> Don't ever do it. But well done. Well done. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, I, I really like to travel and you guys have, because of um, the conventions and all of that, you get to travel a lot. So my question is, if you could visit um, somewhere again for like the very first time and experience it for the first time, where would, where would that be? Does it have to be again or can it just be anywhere? Both. Either. Okay. Because you're about new experiences. Yeah. yeah. I'd like, 
newly I'd like to experience Africa. I've not been to Africa. Yeah. Uh, to go again, would it, does it, for a convention or just anywhere? No, just anywhere that you've been and just experiencing it again. I'd go back to Bali. Oh wow, I've never been. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, so it's paradise. Yeah. But like I, 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 I was in Laos in 2002. Um, and I think they really only officially opened their borders to tourists in 98, so it was like really kind of remote and it was a really special experience. But I'm like, like Jeff, I, like there's so many places in the world that I'd like to see. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I've done, my sister lives in Cape Town in South Africa and I've been to North Africa, but I'd love to do the middle. I'd love, I haven't done South America, have you done South America? Yeah, yeah. I really want to do uh, Colombia, I want to do Peru. Peru. And then, uh, Guatemala I've been to. Uh, and I'll, yeah, Can I say Costa Rica? No, Costa Rica. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I love it. Yeah, I love it. And I, uh, Brazil. I haven't been to Brazil. Their fans in Brazil are lunatics. They're great fans. You know, I'd love to go to. I'd love to go to a, a convention in Brazil. Yeah, I think that would be pretty epic. Um, let's organize that. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, there's so many places. I don't know where have you. Like, what's what's your story? Um, if I could go back and experience Amsterdam for the very first time, uh, I, I mean, I've only been once, but... I <laughs> you don't remember it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Amsterdam, baby! <laughs> I don't, I'm not allowed back. Pardon? I'm, I'm not joking, I said I wasn't allowed back. Oh. <laughs> um, Amsterdam is, is a good place, though. And my family's from there, so... Oh, cool. Well, just outside. Amsterdam? Yeah, well, it's fine threat to be... Fine threat? Yeah, that's my dad's point. Very good, very good, very good. Um, yeah, the, the Dutch are cool folks. Really cool. <laughs> good peeps. Yeah, I were, I've been to Amsterdam too. I went to uh, the Van Gogh Museum was my favorite there. Yeah. 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 Changed my life. Sure. I made it there. <laughs> Hi. Hi guys. Sorry, I'm just on my tippy toes. Um, thanks. Yeah, we have, a, we have technology for there that. We go. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, Adam, I'm a big fan, but sorry, this question is for Jeffrey. Pleasure. Okay, um, so I actually went to VegasCon last year, and I got to see some of your artwork. Uh, I'm a big fan, so I was wondering where you kind of found your, your first passion for art. Well, thank you. And I'm going to have some original pieces here and some framed prints, if anyone is available. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, maybe a painting class one day. Um, funnily enough, the trip to Amsterdam, that was a, so I had, I had dabbled around in, in painting uh, in my late teens, early 20s, um, just dabbled. And then in my, I think it was 24 or 25, I was, I was cast in a film that shot in Berlin. And I had never been to Europe, so I asked them to pay me in cash and fly me out of Prague two months later. And so I took cash and I backpacked Europe by myself. That's awesome. And that trip completely changed my life. And there were times that I hadn't spoken to someone in a day or two or three, and I would go into a museum and see a painting from a painter that is dead 500 years, yet this painting was so alive and and made me feel so connected to humanity that I thought that's what I want to do. And so that's that trip I took my vows as a painter and when I came back I, I, I hadn't stopped painting since. What a great place to do it. Like yeah, yeah man, all the all the amazing museums. I got to commune with all the masters and it's it's amazing. Just, yeah, it was wonderful. Yeah. How could you not? That's awesome. Are we being kicked off? That's it. We're, you're being graciously ushered off. It's not kicked off. It's different. Okay. With kindness and love and affection. This is the first time I've ever been graciously uh, excused from the stage. I'm normally booted off. Usually, yeah, usually it's a, a big hook pulling you off with a big fat apology to the audience afterwards. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Adam Ferguson, Jeffrey Perlin. Thank you, everybody.